Hi everyone, I hope you're having a great day. I have a great interview for you guys today. About a month ago, I teased you guys about an interview that I was gonna do with Mr. Nick Flom. He is the director of the Northern Plains UAS test site up by Grand Forks, North Dakota. Now, North Dakota is one of the leaders when it comes to UAS technology in the industry, in particular, the commercial drone industry. We have invested over $44 million so far into the industry. We have about 40 companies that are related to UAS and UAV uh, in our state, which is pretty good for as small of a state as we are. But uh, Mr. Flom is a very busy man, and so I really appreciate him taking some time out today to visit with me. Basically, what I wanted to, to accomplish by visiting with him is I kind of wanted to see how do they do things there? Like, how do they conduct beyond visual line of sight? How do they conduct you know, some of the testing as far as mitigation, you know, trying to determine if somebody is good or bad flying a drone and, and all kinds of things. And then also kind of want to get his perspective on, you know, as the commercial drone industry develops, um, is it going to hurt or is it going to help the recreational drone industry? Because that is always going to be a topic of discussion. So, so I was interested to get his perspective on that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you guys the video uh, it, it got a little bit long, but there's a lot of great information in there. So I hope you guys get something out of it. And then what I'll do is I'll come back and I'll do some closing remarks. So here is Mr. Nick Flom. All right, Mr. Nick Flom, how are you doing today? I'm great. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for being here. I know you're a busy guy. I can't believe I finally got in touch with you and made this happen. So you're traveling all over the nation doing all kinds of drone stuff. So that's great. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. All right. So first of all, Nick, can you please explain kind of the overall mission of the Northern Plains UAS test site and like what is your role specifically at the facility? Sure. Absolutely. So, you know, back in uh, 2012, um, uh, Congress recognized that, uh, you know, UAS drones are going to become a thing. Um, so they mandated the FAA to Select six, uh, select six test sites across country. Um, North Dakota was selected as one of those. And uh, we're, the final selection came uh, December of 2013. So we've been doing this for a little bit over five years now. Um, the initial uh, mandate uh, has actually been extended out twice where uh, the mandate now goes through uh, September of 2023. So I'll say, um, you know, when you look back historically, there was no such thing as 333s back then. There was no such thing as 107s. Um, you know, very minimal. You know, UAS use even going back. You know, just over five years ago. Um, our role. Um, you know, I'll say help the FAA integrate UAS into the airspace. What's that mean? Um, you know, we do. Um, uh, we can support flight operations on a research and development standpoint. We take that information, um, the data that we collect. Uh, some of it's just as simple as. Where did you fly? How long did you fly? What kind of airplane did you fly? Um, and you, we give that information to the FAA, and they can start coming up with, you know, a framework for, for rulemaking. Um, sure. You know, that's kind of the baseline of uh, of what we're trying to achieve from the test site. So, are we? Could you say that your test site, along with, I think, is it Virginia and Nevada as well, are kind of designing the blueprint for how commercial drone operations are going to go into the future? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so we're we're looking, you know, incrementally um, at, at all that. So, if, you know, people who are involved with uh, 333 uh, exemptions a couple of years ago, um, they all got a uh, a blanket uh, COA across the United States. Um, short answer, I'd say that they learned how to do that working with the, with the test sites. Uh, North Dakota really early on got a, a statewide approval um, to to fly. It was the first time the FAA had ever given that large of an area of approval. Um, and now they can use that same type of framework to do 333s. Um, test site very early on, uh, you know, we got approval for, for night operations. Um, now they can use our lessons learned from that, our safety case. And, you know, when somebody puts in a waiver for uh, uh, night operations, you know, um, it'd be hard pressed to say that we didn't have anything to do with some of the, the safety case work that the FAA is now using. That's really cool. So do you think they chose us because 
nobody lives here because we're so wide open? Um, yeah, I'm going to go with because uh, everyone wants to come here. And, All know, right. <laughs> this yeah. is the North Dakota tourism at its finest. Um, Absolutely. No, you know, there was, um, you know, ac- across the U.S., they wanted to have uh, diversity. Um, they wanted to have, um, uh, you know, climate as a, a diversity. Um, of course, our uh, we do have very low traffic density in the air. We have... Um, uh, you know, great uh, um, land use uh, limited for testing environment. Um, but at the same point, we have, um, you know, uh, a good history in, in UAS. Um, you know, we have a, a Air Force Base in Grand Forks that, um, you know, was flying the MQ-1s, MQ-9s, the Global Hawks, all out of one base on the military side. Um, uh, the Grand Forks County Sheriff's Office, kind of in the Northeast District, I mean, they were one of the first law enforcement agencies uh, to, to use UAS. University of North Dakota, you know, first uh, four year to have an undergreed bachelor program for UAS. Um, so, you know, we had a, a lot of the pieces in place already and, um, you know, extreme temperatures, that helps, uh, you know, from a, a testing environment standpoint. Sure. Absolutely. So I know you guys do a lot of stuff. There's a lot of studies going on, you know, just viewing your website. I'll put it up on the screen here. Just taking a look at the graphics, you can see there's a lot uh, to talk about, but I just want to focus on a few things. And one of them, beyond visual line of sight operations, that's kind of a kind of a hot button topic, I guess. So can you explain the process involved when you guys conduct that type of research at your site? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, um, I kind of look at uh, Beyond Visual Line of Sight, if I were to overly simplify it into, you know, three components. Um, one is the aircraft. You know, do I even have an airplane that has good enough endurance to fly Beyond Visual Line of Sight? You know, I probably need something that has a, a battery that lasts more than 20 minutes. Otherwise, I'm not really getting that far. Uh, second is radio line of sight. Um, you know, generally, um, the radio... Um, Frequencies that we're flying on, Part 15 devices, ISM band, they have very low, um, you know, radio line of sight. Um, so that's a, a limiting factor. And then, of course, um, you know, the the see and avoid, the surveillance component. How do I make sure that we don't run into other people that are out there flying? So early on the test site, you know, we wanted to start, you know, testing out some of these different types of technologies. If it was C2 radio technology, radars for detecting of aircraft, um, so one of the first things that we got approval for was to, to daisy chain visual observers. So I could, uh, you know, on the ground, I could emulate an environment that the airplane could fly beyond visual line of sight. I had people lined up out there. Um, and I use that as a primary means for the, the detect and avoid. But then I could run a radar in the background. I could run a different radio on the aircraft. And in that environment, we were able to collect information um, for those operations, bring that to the FAA as a, a safety case that not only, you know, do we think we can do it, we have done it, we did it at the test site, and, uh, you know, you turn that into uh, an advanced approval. So, um, you know, that's just kind of one of those mechanisms that we can um, uh, use as a, as a backbone in order to get some of these uh, advanced waivers uh, approved. Cool. So kind of related to that, um the, re- the replacing a visual observer with technology, like uh, just a few weeks ago, Echodyne Radar, I see, was kind of signed on with you guys. And, you know, as far as far as being a partner with tracking and detection of, of commercial drones. So what would be their role and how complex is that process of automated situational awareness? Yeah, I mean, that's some, uh, it's a great question. You know, so they, you know, Echodyne, for example, they have uh, two products. They have a ground-based radar and they also have an airborne radar. Um Quite honestly, the airborne radar, that's, um, you know, we don't have a ton of, you know, size, weight, power in order to, to carry some of these things. Um, that's that's challenging. Yeah. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on uh, what's it look like to use a ground-based radar as as part of the solution. Um, you know, so you start removing um, the uh, you know, <coughs> observer with technology, like you said. Uh, and something else that we've been studying for uh, a long time doing research on is a visualization screen. You know what? The radar is going to give you track information, and it needs to be visualized somewhere. I need to be able to reference that to where my own aircraft's position is, especially when I can't see either of them. Um, sure. And have it in a um, you know in a display um, that is 
understandable. And then I go into, okay, I see somebody who's out there flying. I see a threat. Um, you know, I need to now make a maneuver in order to, to avoid them. Um, and this goes into, again, different testing we're doing with like radars, for example, is how far out can they see? And is that enough? Uh, is it enough to not only be able to detect uh, other traffic that's out there, but also give me enough time to maneuver the UAS into a, a safe state um, so that everyone can uh, you know, pass by and, and nobody has a, a problem out there. Sure. Cool. So kind of, you know, segueing into that, another uh, interesting topic is UAS detection and, and counter UAS. So without revealing any classified type of information, can you tell me how you conduct a test uh, regarding that? Yeah, I mean, the, so, you know, um, this is, uh, of, of course, with every good technology like UAS, you have to have the bad players. So we have to come up with a way to, to mitigate against that. Um, I break down uh, like counter UAS into two separate components. Uh, one is the detection. Um, detection is, uh, it's fairly easy to do in our current environment. Um, but the technology is, you know, where some of the challenges comes into play. Um, you know, why can't I just use a, an existing radar? Well, an existing radar that was used for manned aircraft, you know, generally has a, a cross section of about, um, you know, the size of me, you know, maybe six feet by six feet. You know, it's trying to paint the side of a, a Cessna 172, um, not, you know, something that's, you know, I can hold in my hand. Right. So we need new type of technology um, on that. And we started doing some of the stuff with the FAA actually um, out of the uh, Denver International Airport. And um, I suppose it was like in, uh, oh, 2017, uh, we were actually doing operations at the airport, flying UAS, um, having detection uh, system out there um, and doing it in a, an environment that also has interference from, you know, manned aviation. Sure. Uh, the detection side, um, is um, you know from a, a testing standpoint, um, there, what's trying to be determined is you know do I have to have a um, you know if I'm am I only looking at DJI type products um, you know where I can maybe get my a fingerprint of you know what their signal looks like um, and that's probably okay for ninety percent of the the drones that are flying out there. Um, but what about the other, you know, 10%? Um, you know, those were some of the different challenges start to, to come into play um, where we maybe don't have a, um, you know, a Rolodex of all these different signals out there. Sure. Then I go into the defend side of it, the counter side. Um, that's where the challenges come into play. Um, the um, most of it, we can't counter UAS um, because of uh, uh, existing federal laws. Uh, Title 18 of the federal code says that I can't shoot down an airplane. Um, right. A UAS, by definition, is an airplane. So shooting a UAS down is no different than shooting down a 747. I know sure. it sounds ridiculous, but that's yeah. the way that it is. Yep. We also have um, uh, these are computers. Um, so we have um, you know anti-hacking laws. You know that prevent us from going into a computer, hacking it, and telling it to go fly somewhere else. Um, we have wiretapping laws, you know, where I'm listening for what a signal is. We've got laws against GPS jamming. So that's why, you know, um, counter UAS is tough. And then another tough component is how do you actually determine that it's a, a friend or foe? You know, right. Um, that's the biggest thing. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, we'll, we'll start to get um, there's rulemaking coming out in regards to uh, remote identification of UAS. And that's going to be at least another one of those baseline that it can kind of give us an idea of who are they, should they be here, um, and you know, helping that uh, you know decision tree kind of matrix of whether or not that this is a a clueless operator who just is oblivious to what's going on, a careless one where maybe they know the rules but it's okay, or is this apps, you know a criminal? And right. that's that's uh, to do that in a very short period of time um, yeah. is is really challenging. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So, well, yeah, I, I find that very interesting that, you know, that has always been, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a topic of discussion in the drone world of, you know, there's been all these regulations, people are developing these rules and our lawmakers are making these rules for problems that don't yet exist. And that's always been an issue that I've had. Um, 
But at the same time, you also want to mitigate ahead of time to make sure that, you know, safety is priority number one. So it it is a very tough situation and it's a very, it's going to be very challenging times for people like yourself and, and others in the industry that are trying to, you know, don't want to squash the hopes and dreams of hobbyists, right. uh, but still develop commercial technology, advancing, advancing the industry as much as we can, you know, and, and making reasonable laws and things like that. So yeah, definitely a, a challenging thing and, and, and will always be a topic of discussion forever, I think. So, yeah. you know, so kind of in regards to that, a, a lot of people watching this are, most people watching this are recreational pilots and things like that. And it's always kind of been, um, you know, it's us versus them, commercial versus recreational pilots are, you know, the, the fear is that as commercial, as the commercial side of things develops and as they start to take over the skies, that recreational pilots are going to be, you know, kind of pushed out and say, okay, you guys can fly in this little park over here, but if you go beyond that barrier, you're in trouble or, you know, so a lot of people have that fear that are in this hobby that have been in this hobby or any kind of RC hobby that as the commercial increases is the recreational side going to decrease. And so it's a, it's a big fear. I mean, there's millions of drone owners out there that are like wondering, should I sell my drone? I'm not going to be able to fly it anyway. So um, I guess, what would you say to encourage hobbyists, recreational yeah. pilots that research going right now at, at your site and other sites is going to overall benefit all sectors of UAS. So I'm going to start with, you know, if we were to like be able to roll back time a little bit here and I would say the FA is probably, you know, a lot of ways going, um, we had some missteps along the way, you know, just because of, you know, the cat came out of the bag a little bit uh, too quick here on some of this stuff. And we, we had to start putting rules in place that didn't look at the big picture of things. Sure. I think if we were to, to step back and if we were to look at an, an overall, um, you know, if I had a timeline of what would be the appropriate steps on how to roll all this stuff out, I think a lot of these um, issues that we have, um, and quite honestly in the hobby world, I feel that um, they're getting, you know, it's like a tug of war, um, you know, with uh, with that entire group um, because they're, uh, there's part of it is being an afterthought and then also maybe being a concern and whether or not the two are real is uh, again you know some of it's speculative um i go back to you know just on the very front edge you know some of the challenges right out of the gate with uas you know when we were initially introduced to it all um we were introduced to uh uas um, especially some of the the small consumer grade drones before there was rules out there um you know um uh, we had um you know, uh, DJI was already had the Phantom out before 107 came out, before 333s came out. I mean, most of the initial 333 exemptions were, you know, the Phantom 2s, uh, you know, at the time. Okay, so that's like a, an overall issue. We're introduced to something that was given to us before we even had a baseline set of rules tied to it. And then it's just been, ever since then, let's hurry up and, and wait. So I think that, you know, having... Um, uh, if we were to go back again in time and if we could actually, it's easy to work under a set of rules. Um, cause I, even hobbyists, there's, there's rules that have to be followed. And I don't think that anybody is opposed to, to following what those are. It sure. just becomes very confusing on which one am I supposed to follow? Which one am I not supposed to follow? Is this going to change tomorrow? Um, that's, that's more of what the, the challenges from, from my standpoint, as I look at this kind of holistically, is um, if we have a, a baseline framework in order to follow, if I if if the um, if a hobby user understood, hey, you know, I need these eight things in order to go fly, and a 107 guy needs these 16 things in order to fly, maybe I still want to. I have no problem following these eight things. I just don't want it to be eight things today, nine things tomorrow, ten things the next day, and that's really the the downside of of everything right now. Right. We're coming up with, um, as actually as I think that more of the commercial rules come into play, it's going to maybe stabilize the hobby um, 
framework a little bit more. Um, we won't be chasing it as much. We're not going to be trying to follow it up. And yes, there might be, there may be elements that um, get added into um, to recreational users. There, there is a, you know, we've seen. Should we register them? Should we not register them? Uh, that ambiguity causes frustration. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. If we're just to say, hey, period, everyone's going to register. Right. A hobbyist can can they go, ah, that stinks, but I can at least follow behind it. Um, Sure. I think when we get into some of the uh, security issues that um, are out there, remote identification um, is going to, you know, do I think that that could be a requirement for all users? Probably, you know, is that um, misfortunate? I think the only thing that's misfortunate about it is the timing of it all. I think that we should have had a remote ID or in a registration process before we, you know, as a part of the initial you know, framework of regulation, or, you know, as an initial framework, you know, way at the beginning, it's coming a little bit too late to the game. And uh, it seems like we're trying to, to catch up with it, as opposed to just trying to, to follow along what's going on. Right. And just because of the rapid growth and the rapid industry on, on, on all sectors, there's even more frustration, because like you said, it's just you never know. You're going to wake up one day and, for instance, like just yesterday where the FAA said, well, guess what? Now you're going to have to put your registration number on the outside of the drone right. instead of the inside. Not a big deal, right? I mean, who cares? Put your number on the outside. Put it on the inside. It doesn't really matter. But but it's just one of those things where you wake up and like, oh, this is another new rule they just came up with. So so I get what you're saying. There There isn't a framework. It's getting pieced as we go. And that is the biggest issue, I think. It's not that people are afraid of having rules. I mean, we have rules for everything, for driving, for, you know, it's just everything. And so it's just not there for UAS because it hasn't come along. So I guess the biggest concern that I have seen from my subscribers and my viewers is that, you know, the hobbyists don't have much input uh, or they feel like they don't have much input when it comes to these new rules. But at the same time, my suggestion is, you know, here in North Dakota, we have uh, right now at a legislature, there's some rulings, some bills being introduced, you know, stating that privacy is a big issue and we need to make rules for drones on privacy. So my standpoint is contact your legislator, keep an eye on what's going on in your state. And, and that's the, that's how you have a voice. You contact your officials. And if you don't like what your officials are doing, don't vote for them next time. Right. So, so it is a way for us to have a voice, um, you know, and then the federal register, you know, when things come out, you know, the comment period, uh, that gives you an opportunity to, to voice your opinion. So, so there are avenues for people to express how things are being done. But, but like you said, it is, um, it's a frustrating thing. It's going to be a, a difficult road. I think a difficult road as as we continue, but eventually I think we're going to get there. We just need to have some patience. So, you know, and I, I do a lot of work with, um, uh, I'm on a, the unmanned aircraft safety team. It's a FAA, you know, led, uh, you know, safety group that essentially, you know, it's an outreach from, from a safety standpoint. Okay. And, uh, you know, during that group, I've got, to, um, you know, AMA is, uh, you know, one of the, uh, you know, main uh, contributors, to, you know, to the group. And um, it's been, you know, from their standpoint, it's it's always great to to hear um, in these types of discussions. You know, having uh, I'll say AMA's voice at at the table, I think is is really strong. I think that you know for for somebody who's looking to you know want a voice on the on the hobby side, um, you know they they do have um, um, you know representation at a lot of these you know their working groups. They're trying to you know find that appropriate balance on behalf of you know, of all of the, the hobbyists out there. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it's just uh, uh, another one of these avenues, I think that, um, um, you know, people are out there, you know, defending both sides and trying to understand, you know, how to navigate all of this. Um, it's, uh, you know, maybe, maybe in five years, the frustrations will be behind us because there's something that's actually a little bit more stable. I mean, this is... Yeah. Um, again, I look at, you know, it's because it's not, you know, again, like what you just mentioned on this uh, markings um, and what we're going to see with remote ID. 
Um, this is affecting commercial users as well. I mean, I had a process in place on how to, to mark my aircraft, and now today I have to do it differently. Is there going to be a grandfathering in? Is there not? Is this, you know, I mean, no, we're going to just stick with it. Those are, those are challenges. Um, and, uh, you know, the entire industry is feeling these growing pains as, as we come along. And, um, again, I, unfortunately, having better guidance um, will, I think, you know, kind of level everything out and at least gives us something to point to uh, over time that will give us, hey, if I want to become a hobbyist, I should not be afraid to become a hobbyist. You know, if I want to fly for hobby use, you know, there are a set of procedures. Um, can you get frustrated because things change? Sure. As a commercial operator on 107, can I be frustrated that things change? Sure. You know, it's, uh, we're all kind of living through this together right now. Yeah, I think people need to understand going into it, the, the, if the expectation is there, then it's not so bad. It's it's the shock of right. the afterwards, you know. So so I think things like this, people like you, educating, you know, being on that committee, um, you know, information is huge. And and when there's a lack of information, there's going to be prejudice, and there's going to be you know, people are going to be like, oh my god, what's going on? And you know, they're going to throw the drones in the garbage, and we don't want that. I really oh. don't want that because I just got into this hobby two years ago, and it's 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 an awesome hobby and the people in it are so great everyone is so you know you don't have you never have drone um pilots fighting with other drone pilots they're all a one big group you know it's not right. like other it's not like other things so so it's been great so i hope it i hope as we go through this that um like i said i just can't stress enough how much patience is necessary in this whole process so yes yeah so Final question, over the next five years, yep. when it comes to commercial drone technology, where do you see us going? Where where do you see the biggest, most noticeable thing for the average person? What are they going to see as, as our nation develops commercial drones? Um, you know, one of the things that I'm following really closely, um, which is very interesting, is called urban air mobility. Um, this is, um, you know, lack of a better term, uh, flying cars. Um, sure. Uber, Uber has a program called Uber Elevate, you know, yep. where you're essentially taking, um, um, I'll say, an oversized uh, multi-rotor and you're throwing, you know, people in it. On the front end, this, this is going to be something that's going to have a pilot, you know, sitting, you know, behind the controls, moving a couple of people. Um, but, you know, over time, you know, we can maybe start uh, – removing the, the pilot out of the out of the aircraft um and uh i mean it's like pretty incredible i mean maybe on the front end we see this from a cargo delivery boxes don't get as scared as people but uh yeah. you know i i think that we're going to start to see you know really start to to turn the corner on um you know some of these advanced you know um types of opportunities we hear about package delivery and you know quite honestly the package delivery goes way beyond just um, you know, the Amazon and Google, I mean, it's everything from, you know, what Flirty is doing with um, uh, defibrillators to, you know, what Matternet is doing with, uh, you know, rural medicine. Um, I mean, the opportunities are going to be, um, you know, just really starting to take off. We're going to have the infrastructure, I think, in place to start enabling some of these beyond visual line of sight operations. And that's going to just really open up, you know, more and more uh, things that we haven't even thought of yet. Right. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting time. It's always interesting to read, <clears throat> excuse me, drone news and see what's going on because there's always there's always something like every week there's just something just amazing. So, right. so I can't wait to see where we are five years from now. So it makes two of us for sure. Cool. Well, that's all I have for you, Nick. Um, got to be kind of a long interview, but I think the information is uh, is gonna people are gonna appreciate it. Um, it it's nice to have people like you to help us understand, you know, this whole thing going on with commercial drones. And so, so I, uh, I do appreciate it. So. Hey, glad this worked out. I, I, again, thank you for your patience with me. This oh, is... not, not a problem. You're a busy man traveling all over, yeah. you know, even in the dead of winter, the drone industry does not slow down oh. in North Dakota, right? Right. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Nick. And uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, I hope so. All right. All right. Thanks. All right. So what did you think? 
interesting stuff, right? He's a fascinating guy and he really has a lot of responsibilities. So, so again, once again, thank you, Mr. Flom, for visiting with me and being able to present some of this information to, uh, to all of you guys. So my final thoughts on this. The commercial drone industry is going to continue to grow. It's going to continue to expand. Money's going to continue to pour into it because it's huge. And it's, it's a big part of what's going to happen in the future when it comes to UAVs. At the same time, um, there's going to be some struggles for recreational pilots. There's no denying that. And, and I, I've said it twice already, and I'm going to say it again. It's going to take a lot of patience on both sides. There's going to be some laws that people are not used to. Uh, just like Nick said, we're kind of behind uh, behind the ball here when it comes to developing the rules because not everyone knows what's going to happen as, as the industry grows. And so there's going to have to be some rules that are made that we're, we're not expecting. And personally, I'm okay with rules as long as we have input on what happens. This is the Wild West, you guys. We are in the Wild West of UAVs. And we survived it in the past, you guys. We survived it, you know, in the 1800s, in the early 20th century. And so this is just our version of that. So my biggest advice to you guys is communicate with your legislators. And some of you might not have legislators that you like, but that's okay. They are there to listen to you. So keep track of what's going on in your legislature and, and, and let the people know, let your elected officials know how you feel. Also continue to do research like this. Listen to people like Nick and, and read up on all the advancements of the commercial drone industry. And if you educate yourself on what's going on on that sector, then you can be more informed as to how you make decisions when it comes to making rules for the private sector, for hobbyists like us. Yes, I'm a commercial drone pilot in part 107, but honestly, I don't do much of that. I just fly for fun. I like to get photography and videography and things like that. So um, just patience, guys. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. Comment below your thoughts on this interview. Let me know if it was interesting to you. And if it was, I'll try to do more of this. I'm actually going to go up to Grand Forks this summer and hopefully uh, Nick will give me a chance to tour the facility a little bit and show you guys what it's all about. So hit the like button if you got anything of value out of this. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more information like this, more content like this. I really appreciate it. Thank you for watching today. And as always, fly safe and fly smart.